Hello there, welcome to the channel. It's your pal Noms here. And today I thought I'd talk about a topic I have neglected to discuss for a long time. And what I considered for the longest time to be the worst MCU movie ever made. And one of the worst films I had seen up to that point in my life. And that is none other than Iron Man 3. Now firstly, as customary with my Massacre series, there is an introduction that is in order. Back in 2013, the year of release for this steaming pile, I was probably Hollywood's biggest mark. I'd just walk in and out of the theatre loving such retarded cinematic gems as Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, <laughs> Alien vs Predator Requiem, and perhaps most shamefully X-Men Origins Wolverine. Yes, and what's even worse is that I thought they were products of actual quality. I was absolutely retarded back in the day, and I have no shame in admitting that. We've all been there at some point in our lives. Matter of fact, I was this way regarding cinema right up until about 2017. The straw that broke the camel's back was the infamous Ryan Johnson jizz container known as Star Wars The Last Jedi. From then on my eyes were opened and I chose to approach every new piece of content I viewed with a far more critical lens. And it's even caused me to reevaluate content I had already consumed to see how it holds up after another viewing. But up until then, I had only ever rarely left the theatre being either heavily conflicted on a movie like I was with The Last Jedi. I remember being soundly disappointed after watching Die Hard 5, which I may one day make a series on. But Iron Man 3 is the only film I remember walking out of the theatre and feeling absolutely furious. I had rarely been hyped for a movie as much as I was for Iron Man 3. The exceptions being Revenge of the Sith, Return of the King, and probably Avengers 2012. Which was not only an incredible movie and spectacle, but Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man was undoubtedly one of the best parts of that movie, which made me even more excited to see this movie which was the direct sequel to Avengers in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But what we got was quite possibly the most insulting film as cinema fans, MCU fans, and fans of Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man. This is coming from someone who has never read an Iron Man comic, though I'm fully aware as to why the comic readers were furious, and we'll get to that in due time. But for me, walking out of the cinema back in 2013, I was honestly livid that I waited for so long and was so hyped for an absolute shitfest of a movie. I originally attributed my anger to Jon Favreau being the one to blame in this instance. Not only because he was the director for the first two Iron Man movies, but also because I thought his influence on Iron Man 2 was what led to his character Happy Hogan in that movie was not only annoying as hell, but utterly pointless overall. Perhaps Jon Favreau had had too much creative control and was simply jingling his balls in our face, but nope. In actuality, the reins of Iron Man 3 were handed to none other than this jackass, Shane fucking Black. The most out of touch, tone deaf, overrated, and mentally retarded director working today. It honestly blows my mind that people defend this guy's work. Now admittedly, I haven't seen all of his films, and he has released several gems in his career. Bafflingly, he wrote the first two Lethal Weapon movies, he wrote The Last Boy Scout, which was one of my favorite action movies as a teen, and he wrote The Last Action Hero, which I thought was painfully mediocre. Now that's as far as this man goes for his writing career from the late 80s and early 90s. And that's when I think this guy got hit in the head with a blunt object that prevented the part of his brain that gets with the fucking times. And so it just stayed in limbo from that point on because his 80s and 90s humour, which can basically be summed up as him making fun of and misrepresenting stereotypes of people with mental illnesses or being as vulgarly inappropriate as possible during the most inappropriate time accompanied by some of the worst one-liners I have ever heard. And his out-of-date style is most evident when he is acting as director as well as the lead writer of his projects. Yes, this is present throughout Iron Man 3 and we'll get to that. But let's look at the most recent example, and what I consider to be one of the worst movies and biggest franchise butcherings ever put to film. The Predator, 2018. Dear God, when I saw this in cinemas, I couldn't actually believe what I was seeing. This motherfucker went full-blown Ramsey Bolton on the Predator franchise. And this is coming from someone who went in expecting to see another Shane Black dumpster fire. Seriously, when I saw the Predators teaser poster, I was extremely excited. And throughout the official trailer, in the lead up to its release, I kept most of my excitement right up until the trailer showed this. Alien. Guess who's back? It ain't the fucking 
Oh my god, my insides are on fire! And immediately, all the excitement I had for the Predator 2018 was buried six feet under my anus. Right there and then, I knew that film was going to suck. And the reason I knew this was because of, you guessed it, Iron Man fucking 3. Oh, and in typical Shane Black humor, there was also this tone-deaf abortion of a joke in the actual trailer of a Predator film. Which means the humans are fucked. In that movie, Shane Black proceeds to misrepresent Tourette's Syndrome, which I actually have, by the way. How do you circumcise a homeless man? Here it goes. Kick your mom in the chin. <laughs> Fuck your mother! Fuck your mother! He misrepresents Asperger's Syndrome. EJ, you hungry? I'm hungry for an Asperger. Mmm, sounds delicious. He uses these two mental disorders as a crutch for his humor. He also turns the iconic villains of the Predator series, the Predators themselves, into absolute jokes, and changes the law without an ounce of remorse, and uses several twists in order to try and prompt himself up as a writing genius, while simultaneously making a joke of just about every single situation by subverting your expectations. And yes, just about all of this is applicable to Iron Man 3 as well. It honestly bewilders me how some people say Iron Man 3 saved the character after Iron Man 2, I honestly have no idea what the fuck they are talking about. Iron Man 2 structurally has some massive holes in logic. Not many, but the ones that are in there are pretty damn big. Now, with that said, despite that, Iron Man 2 gives Tony Stark and his family and his technology some further backstory and further nuance. It makes Tony vulnerable and provides the audience an extremely cathartic throughline for his character as he discovers life-changing revelations, successfully confronts his terminal illness, and opens up romantically to the person he cares about the most. Flaws and all, it's a solid journey for Tony, and it's all executed without making ridiculous, out-of-place, 80s humor bullshit that makes light of Tony's character development all over the goddamn place. No insulting subversive twists that openly laugh at the audience, and no bullshit that breaks the law and cheapens the Iron Man character as a whole. I cannot say the same for Iron Man 3. These are the reasons why it's one of my most hated movies of all time, and these are also the reasons why it is one of the worst movies in the MCU. Anyway, that pretty much sums up my intro. Let's get started dissecting this pile of dog shit. Shall we? So the movie begins with Tony Stark monologuing some philosophical mumbo-jumbo of, quote, We create our own demons. Which isn't inaccurate, by the way. Psychology can be a bitch. And sometimes we create our own monsters for anxiety based on small, unpleasant experiences we have. For example, getting bitten by a dog on the arm as a child can fester in one's mind and can result in an extreme phobia of dogs going forward as an adolescent and even into adulthood. Even though most dogs typically aren't violent, the fear has grown into a demon that plagues the mind, with fear of the stimulus or fear by association to the stimulus. The statement, we create our own demons, can be used to great effect for the right context, but that's not what happens. So it opens up with a flash forward of Tony Stark's Iron Man suits blowing up one by one, which I'd assume is foreshadowing for the very end of the movie. I would applaud this if the ending wasn't stupid as shit, but we will get there. The year is 1999, New Year's Eve, 13 years prior to current year of the MCU timeline the film takes place in. Tony is at a celebration in Switzerland. He looks to be at some sort of tech summit, raking in the new millennium with some of the world's most best and brightest minds. Now we see Tony and some other woman from his past, who honestly I couldn't even remember her name after this movie finished and still couldn't recite it to you off the top of my head as I'm writing this for you right now. Tony Stark is still at the stage in his life of being an immature, sleazy billionaire playboy who doesn't appear to take anything seriously. The woman he is with is eager to show him some of her latest research, and all he is thinking about is getting into her pants. Which is fine, by the way. This is more or less exactly how Tony was before the Afghanistan incident, which led to his dramatic shift in character from the first Iron Man film. And as a matter of fact, we get a grim reference to that as Jensen, the man who saved Tony's life while he was in captivity, and actually placed the original electromagnet in his chest, which Tony then revolutionized into his most valuable piece of technology and an extremely sentimental piece of him personally, the very thing that powers the greatest weapon the world has ever seen, is also the thing that allows Tony to keep breathing. You know, I've got a cluster of shrapnel trying every second to crawl its way into my heart. This stops it. This little circle of light, it's part of me now. Not just armor. It's a terrible 
privilege. The chest piece is extremely important to him personally, and it helps provide the audience with the constant reminder of Tony's past and vulnerability as both a man and as a hero. Make sure to remember that, because we are going to come back to it at the end. Anyway, bottom line is it's cool to see Jensen again, and it's a nice reference to the prior two films. The shadow of Tony's destiny looms large over the intro to this movie, and this just adds to that. Also, John Favreau returns to his role as Happy Hogan. Let me just say this. Personally, I find Happy Hogan much better in the later movies involving Tom Holland's Spider-Man. I think he's utilized much better there. However, in the Iron Man movies, I found him obnoxious, insufferable, and pointless, to be perfectly honest. Now, to be clear, he wasn't really in the first Iron Man movie very much. He was kind of like a cameo in that film. But for me, he was certainly the worst part of Iron Man 2. And in Iron Man 3, he's a little bit better, I will admit, especially with my recent viewings. But still, the majority of his character's humor just doesn't land for me. And while I don't think it's exclusive to Shane Black, I do think Shane Black's humor utilization from the character is even worse. But thankfully, Happy Hogan's humor doesn't outstay its welcome, since his character gets taken out early, and at the very least, he gets something important to do in this movie, and acts as a solid motivation and drive to kick Tony into gear. Now, the mechanics surrounding that are retarded, quite frankly, and we will get to that, but story-wise and screen time-wise, I think Happy Hogan was utilized better in Iron Man 3 than the previous two movies. So that's some mild praise I'm willing to give. Anyway, Tony, Happy, and this mystery woman hurry back to her hotel rooms. However, they are stopped at the elevator door by none other than Aldrich Killian. And for whatever reason, Shane Black turns him into the most stereotypically geeky, creepy nerd I've ever seen. Now, maybe I'm being a bit too harsh criticizing this. I'd assume Marvel Comics are no stranger to the stereotypical jock and nerd dynamic. Many protagonists and antagonists begin as Brainiacs, but based on the information I've obtained from comic readers in my Discord, not only is this not a typically common mannerism from antagonists in the comics, but it isn't even what Aldrich is supposed to be. Yes, he is a scientist, and yes, he is working on the very research known as Extremist that is referenced in this movie. But he's not some greasy, long-haired, buck-toothed, creepy, obsessive fanboy for Tony Stark. And according to my Discord, Aldrich has no tie-in to the Mandarin storyline whatsoever. But we'll get to that. So based on what I know from Shane Black's 1980s mindset, this reeks of him playing up a stereotype he must have had from back in his college days that all smart people are apparently extremely insufferable geeks who look weird and act weird and become obsessive over something or someone to the point of being mentally deranged. The stereotypically creepy nerd by Shane Black. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Aldrich Killian from Iron Man 3. Anyway, Aldrich stops Tony at the elevator and introduces himself. This scene is so rushed and all over the place that I had to replay it at least three times before I realized what exactly was said and who was being said to. Basically, Aldrich says, I am a big fan of your work, but he's talking to the mystery woman. Apparently her name is Miss Hansen. Aldrich also says that he's been following her research since year two of MIT. See, when I saw this on my first two viewings, I thought he was talking primarily to Tony, because he introduces himself to Tony first, then Tony's mystery woman, but he's actually more interested in Miss Hansen's research. So why the hell didn't he introduce himself to her first instead of Tony? I don't know, it's just a bit bizarre to me. But perhaps it was to outline how much of an obsessive fan of Tony's he is, which I briefly touched on isn't even remotely resemblant of his character from the comics, to be blunt, I'm convinced these stereotypical mannerisms he possesses solely exist to provide him some justification for his motivations against Tony throughout the film, but hold that thought. Now, if you look closely here, Miss Hansen in a split-second shot looks visibly curious that someone would take such an interest in her work. Tony tries to downplay it and passively aggressively is trying to get Aldrich to leave. But Aldrich persists, following them up the elevator. He tells them he started up his own company called Advanced Idea Mechanics, in a last-ditch effort for Tony to close the deal with his Woman of the Night without being interrupted any further, he tells Killian exactly what he wants to hear, that he's very excited to work with him and that he will meet him on the roof in five minutes. He just, he just needs to, quote, wet his beak a little bit. Aldrich buys this little lie of his and heads to the roof. Tony and Miss Hansen run over her research back in the hotel room in the closing minutes up until the new year. Miss Hansen goes on to explain the gist of her research, tapping into the part of the brain that governs repair and recoding it to fit any given scenario. Then Happy Hogan gently grazes her pet plant and she tells him the plant doesn't like it and Tony backs her up. 
Be because he just wants to get her into the bedroom, which he does. This will become relevant in a sec because Happy ignores this for some reason and rips off a part of the plant anyway. While they're in the bedroom, Hanson runs through the limitless applications for her research in treating human illness, and when Tony tries to steal a kiss, the plant that Happy disturbed explodes. Hanson isn't surprised, and Tony's a little startled, and as she starts to talk about, quote, a glitch in her research, something she still hasn't figured out yet, before we can get more context on this, after about five seconds of just standing there apparently, Happy decides to tackle Tony on the bed to protect him. <sighs> Not only is the timing way off, but the joke is tone deaf. It denies the audience some exposition on what is going to be the center point MacGuffin of the movie. Granted, we get some later, but again, that joke was not necessary. And it grinds the movie and all its characters to a stop so that we can all indulge in the joke. Now, this type of humor can often be pointless and jarring. Let me give you two examples of productive humor from a character that most people in the most absurd, hyperbolic manner tend to hate on the internet. Jar Jar Binks. Yep, stay with me on this. There's two instances from The Phantom Menace that I'll point out to you, where Jar Jar's humor serves another purpose besides trying to be funny. The first being during the dinner table scene in Anakin's home. Here Jar Jar uses his frog-like tongue to eat apples in the most obnoxious, disgusting, and rude manner, much to the other character's shock. Jar Jar does this once, unchallenged. The second attempt, Qui-Gon Jinn is discussing Jedi reflexes with Anakin, and in the midst of that discussion, catches Jar Jar's tongue, before he can take the apple, demonstrating those very reflexes for the audience. The second instance is when Jar Jar gets his tongue caught in the energy binder of Anakin's pod racer. Jar Jar manages to lose the ability to speak and gets his hand caught in one of the engines. Anakin and Qui-Gon go about their business and Anakin is about to switch on the racer's engines, which is likely going to amputate Jar Jar. Till Padme Amidala, who, spoilers mind you, if you haven't seen The Phantom Menace, Padme Amidala is also the Queen of Naboo, the highest authority of power on her planet, and she is the one who opts to help him out of the situation. With the context of Padme's true identity known, this acts as an insight into her compassion and humility as a ruler, and acts as a bit of foreshadowing for the alliance formed in the final act of the movie when the Gungans come to the Queen's aid. My point is this. Weird, shame black, stop everything right now and laugh humor is littered throughout the entirety of Iron Man 3. And if it does nothing except try to tell a joke in the most inappropriate places, and nothing else, if the joke doesn't land, then the tone of the scene was disturbed for nothing. The flow of the movie was disrupted for nothing. The moment was wasted for nothing, and nothing was gained. By all means, try and tell your joke, just not at the film or the character's expense. Anyway, Tony and Happy are in this awkward position on the bed, and Tony tells him to get off because nothing's wrong. Then the clock reaches midnight and Happy leaves the room. The fireworks sound outside as people rake in the new year and for some reason they just left the fire burning in the hotel room from the exploding plant. I don't know why that was left in the movie, but oh well. And then it cuts to Aldrich on the roof of the hotel while everyone celebrates, hoping that Tony will still show up, as Tony told him he would. But no, he is simply left there waiting. Now for someone who is supposed to be very smart, you'd think he'd know when he's being played or being misled. Again, he is meant to be Tony's biggest fan. After all, I am your biggest fan. And yes, this one point in time, this one little agreement that Tony reneged on that wasn't even sealed in a handshake, yeah, Tony is a scumbag. And he himself knows he was a piece of shit back then. But the motivation for Aldrich's whole anti-Tony Stark revenge Mandarin terrorist campaign starts and ends here. Setting aside the fact that Tony and the Avengers saved Aldrich and the rest of the world in the Battle of New York, and despite the fact that Aldrich is smart enough not to need Tony's help or his funding for the long run, nope, none of that matters, Aldrich now hates Tony Stark and wants to kill him. Not to mention the killing of innocent people to achieve his goals. All that stems from this one small life event, which is basically the equivalent of striking up a conversation with a chick at the bar and having her tell you she'll meet you outside in five minutes so you can go do whatever. Then she stands you up because she was lying. You know what the correct thing to do in a situation like that is? You get the fuck over it. You don't turn into an evil maniac. Well, maybe in Shane Blackland you do. Where he thinks apparently all nerds are desperate, borderline, psychopathic, pathetic people who would take such a monstrous path in life because of something so fucking small. But I'm jumping a little too far ahead. Let's get back to it. Tony lets the audience know why he's telling them this story about Switzerland. He says, because I had just created demons. Again, 
I don't think this is creating demons at all. Tony did a not very nice thing with virtually no repercussions to Miss Hansen or Aldrich for that matter. And they go to extreme lengths to kidnap and attempt to kill him later in the movie as a result. I don't see how this is creating demons at all. This is the result of simply meeting psychopaths. Anyway, we get a flash forward to present day where Tony briefly touches upon his captivity and tells the audience he's now a changed man. As he tries out probably the most infamous and hated design of Iron Man's armor, the Mark 42. It's still in prototype form and Tony has a new method of suiting up. He injects homing chips into his skin so that the suit can come to him and self-assemble. And we have this retarded tone-deaf gag where Tony dances a jig to a remix of Jingle All The Way as he assembles the suit. And it gives you a glimpse into the train wreck we are in for. After Tony gets knocked around like a bumbling buffoon from the self-assembling Iron Man suit, he pulls a pretty cool maneuver and catches the last piece on his face. He then says, I'm the best before the last piece of the suit knocks him into the air and the suit, the Iron Man suit, arguably the most sturdiest and high-tech piece of equipment in the MCU that stood up to Thor's Mjolnir hammer, Captain America's shield, Iron Monger, and the Shatari falls apart like a fucking Lego set. Fuck you, Shane. Anyway, that's about all I have time for. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. Admittedly, I haven't really said much about the film yet, what I focused on primarily is the introduction, my history with the film, my issues with Shane Black and his tendencies, highlighting detrimental patterns to look out for concerning the rest of the movie. But to be perfectly honest, having rewatched the movie again, I gotta say Iron Man 3 does start off semi-promising for the first 20 or so minutes. There's still some measure of good to discuss in this series regarding the film, but before long we are going to come to a quantum fuck ton of bad. And I can't wait to rip it all to shreds. Now, this is the first Massacre series I've done for an MCU film. I mean, I did the Captain Marvel series, but that was experimental. I only saw that movie once, and that project turned into over an hour of criticism for the mechanics of that abortion of a movie. In one sitting. I gotta reiterate that, because apparently that fact was lost on some people who said I got things wrong in the series, but forget to mention that important little detail. Anyway, you can check that out at your leisure, and if you'd like, I have another ongoing Massacre series on The Rise of Skywalker, which currently sits at 7 videos, with probably 20 more on the way when I get around to it. So yeah, check those out. As I mentioned, there's a Discord I run for this channel, which has been helping me with my research for this video and others as well. Please check it out. Discord is basically an online community where followers of this channel can congregate to talk about a range of different topics, ranging from Marvel to Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, you name it. I look forward to seeing you there, and who knows, maybe you'll make some friends along the way. I'd like to give a shout out and thank you to all of my patrons. I appreciate all your support and contributions to the channel. You have my sincere gratitude. If you'd like to support the channel with a monthly donation, even if it's just a dollar per month, the link to Patreon is in the description. Also, I'd like to thank my YouTube members for their contributions to the channel. Thank you to the Star Killers, the Captain Prices, and the Master Chiefs for all of their support as well. It really means the world to me, and I appreciate it. Thank you. If you'd like to become a YouTube member, click the join button below. There's also the channel merch store if you'd like to pick up some awesome new threads and support the channel that way. If you've been keeping up long enough, I'm sure you will find some memes to your liking. Special thanks to Kyle Phantom for helping with the audio editing of this video. You can check out his channel in the link below. If you're an anime fan, you may find his AMVs to your liking. And uh, yeah, that pretty much brings this video to a close. Here's one last thank you for staying till the end of the video. You are a legend, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>